Head over to miniaturemarket.com where they have thousands of board games at discounted prices like Witchstone. Hello my friends, it's the Game Boy Geek here. You're about to see my Allegro one minute overview and final thoughts. This is designed to see if this game warrants more of your time. If it does, just keep watching because then you'll see my full intro overview and final thoughts. However, if you don't want to be spoiled anything and you want to skip right to the full review, use the time index below in YouTube. Witchstone is a strategy game for two to four players where each player will have their own cauldron and they'll be placing hex tiles to do actions and different powers of them depending on how many of the same symbol you can link together. Now in the big cauldron of the board you're going to be building networks of energy which are going to score you points as you complete them but also allowing you to bring witches in and moving them around and putting them in different locations gaining you different actions and end game points. But you're also doing that to try to fulfill prophecies and end game gold cards like having your witches in certain locations or having networks to certain locations or even the amount of witches on the board getting you a certain amount of points more and more the better you do that prophecy. You might also be using wand actions to fly down a track and getting actions and even better versions of them if you're the first one there. Or moving around the pentagram, not only gaining actions that you can use one time for a good power or using them on your board for multiple uses or getting the best points as you pass different spots. And whoever does the best job puzzling out their cauldron, getting the prophecies and fulfilling those and getting points throughout the game for the end game goals is going to be the winner. I love that you're building your own actions just like in Kinetia's ingenious game and it's such a clever puzzle, the best part of this game. You've got gems that are blocking you but you can move them for actions to get you even more actions and give you more flexibility. The different scrolls are going to change your strategy depending on which ones you get for that game and which long term strategy you're working on. You're root building like Ticket to Ride for points and then moving your witches around to try to set yourselves up for some of the end game goals and getting extra bonuses. You're racing down the wand track trying to get to certain bonuses is first to get better versions. There's a randomized setup that keeps every game different. This game packs a lot of game in under an hour for this medium weight euro. It's a Kinesia game that feels like a Steppenfeld game. On the negative side of things, some of the scoring and the timing is a little odd with some of the owls scoring now, but some of them scoring later in the game. And there's only one player aid in there. I would have liked to have seen four, but this game is fantastic. It got a saxophone serenade. Hello my friends, it's the Game Boy Geek here. Today we're going to be slaving over our hot bubbling cauldron, stirring it around, trying to get the best actions out of it, and going to the crystal ball and placing all of our things where they need to be. Today we're taking a look at Witch Stone. This is from r, &R Games and is co-designed by Ryder Canizia, one of my favorite designers. Let me show you how to play this medium weight Euro game and I'll see you on the other side. In Witchstone, each player is going to have their own cauldron, and over the course of the game, players are going to be playing hex tiles to take actions, and they're going to be multiplying as the game goes on. Now here's the big board for Witchstone, and there's many different ways to score points in this game. It's considered what they call a point salad. Each player will start their big witch on one of the towers, and they're going to be building energy routes to do some route building as well into this huge crystal ball. Now, each player is going to have five of these action tiles behind their shield randomly face up like that. And they're going to select one of these. Now there is a shield so that players can't tell which actions you have available to you. And this acts as sort of a little bit of a scoring player aid, if you will. So on your turn, as I showed you, like in the beginning of the video, you can take one of these and you can place it anywhere you want. You just can't place on top of these symbols and you can't place on top of these gems here. So let's say you do something like this. So what this is going to allow you to do is you're going to be able to take the actions of both sides of this, but you're trying to link together the actions of its type, meaning this one also matches this action. And so because this touches this, we're going to get it one, two. We're going to basically get two of those actions. Now essentially that is route building with the energy. So if we had had one action, we could have placed one. You always start from your home castle, uh, but later on after you get to other places, you can go off of there as well, like making a, a root line. Now we could have played, placed both actions by placing this. And now we've completed from here to here. So if you look, sort of like Ticket to Ride, if we've completed a root of two, it's going to get us three points. If we've completed a root of three, six, and a completed root of one would get us one point. Now you can only work on one route at a time, so you couldn't say go like one here, one here, because this is basically saying that no one else is going to be able to build their route there. So you have to decide uh, where you're going to go. So that was the energy action, but you can also take one power of one, because it's not touching any other ones, of that pentagram action. 
So that allows us to go one spot clockwise on this pentagram. We're gonna come back to here and talk about this in a little bit more detail later. And then you'd simply replace that tile from your a random stack that's face down of your color. And so you always have five to choose from. That'll be the next player's turn. Now, when you're placing the next tile, it doesn't have to go next to where you already went. Like, for example, I might put this one over here and I might get two witch actions. Now, for one witch action, you place them face down at your home tower. And for a, another witch action, you can stand it up and you always gain two points when you stand up your witch. And then you can move it anywhere on your route. Now, I had only really built up to here right now, but I'm going to show you like what happens once you start building a big route in this game. For one action, I could decide to go here or I could decide to skip through here and go all the way to here. And that'll be important for certain reasons I'll show you in a minute. But you also always get uh, the bonus chip if there's one there. So this will allow me to take, in this case, an extra, like an energy action. And this will end up becoming two points behind my shield at the end of the game. Now let's say the board looked like this and we want to go all the way here because we really want this little bonus action and we want to be here for certain reasons I'll show later. So for a witch action, we'd lay her down. For another one, we'd pick her up and move her. We'd get two points for standing her up. Now if this was all red, again, one witch action would get us all the way here. But because we have to go through one spot that has an opponent, it costs an additional one witch action for every two locations that you kind of go through to, to get there. So in this case, it costs us one and then an additional one here. So two witch actions to stand it up and go. And then we get here and we get to use this chip again and then get two points. We'd have to use this by the end of the turn. Now you can have witches of different players in each in, in the same location, but you can't have more than one of your own. And anytime a witch is kind of moved or, or is, is you know put in a spot, you won't move it from there. Now that scroll action that we got, we would be able to use this. Now that would allow us to use this to get this first scroll here. Now there's different types of scrolls. One of them is a reinforcing spell like this. Now what this means is anytime I take the witch action, I can turn this card in or flip it over and get two additional actions. But if I don't use this, it's two points at the end of the game. Same for this, but it's energy. Now, speaking of that scroll action, again, it is one like this that you can use when, as you're placing on your board for your turn. This would have gotten us a scroll action with a power of two. Now look also what we're setting up here is because later, if we end up doing something like this, we're going to get one, two, three, four actions of the energy and one of you know the, the witch action there. So you can see how you're sort of set, setting your board up for combos. Now, if we played that scroll of power two, we could get this one or this one. Power three would get us up to here. Power four would get us up to here. Power five would get us all the way up to here. But after these are taken, these are going to sort of slide down. So the ones that you see further, you can get them with a really powerful scroll action, but they'll, you can see what's going to be sliding down as more and more get taken. Now, these other ones are prophecies. Now, these are end game goal cards as we're going to score a lot of your points this way. If you don't end up using them at all, you'll still get a point for it at the end of the game. But this gives you some goals. Like if you have a witch next to this tower. Now, on your player aid, you'll see different icons like this. This is showing you where you would see this. So if you could put one of your witches in one of these sort of whitish towers here. And as you can see, these spots here correspond with these four spots on the board, which are typically the main towers that players actually start in. This is saying, hey, put yourself in one of those. Put yourself, if you have another witch, in a different one of th that type of location, you'll get five. And if you then also have one in the forest, which as you can see is one of these ones, uh, you'd get seven points. So you're going to get three, five, or seven, but if you don't get any of them, it's just one. Like this one's still here. If you have an energy route going to this, plus one of these locations, plus one of those locations, again, using this, then, you know, you get a certain amount of points. How many witches do you have out on the board at the end of the game? So there's lots of different uh, things. So a lot of the prophecies have to do with these types of things of what you're doing out there on the board. Now, there'll be times when you want to place tiles and there's a gem there and you just can't place it there. And that's on purpose. It's a bit of the puzzle. But you can also take an action to move those. For example, if I do this, I'm getting a power of two for the gem action. What that allows you to do is move these gems out of the way. So if I really wanted to place this there, I can do something like this. One, two, for example. Now they have to, and they can go over occupied spots, but they have to end on an empty spot. Now I could play this there. Now let's say a little bit later on, I do something like this, and now I'm gonna get three gem actions and a witch action, of course. Uh, and then for my first two gem actions, I go one, two. Now when I do this, see it's on the pentagram sign. We're gonna take this off. And you can either find the pentagram sign and place it here and take two pentagram actions, or you can always place it on the bottom on one of these and get what it does. So for example, we can go like this and put this behind, and this is gonna be three points, for example, that I'll get 
Uh, and I'm also going to flip it over and get two points at the end of the game. So that's straight five points by the end of the game for that one. Some of them give you different actions. Now, there's a, there's a you know, for three or four players, you can have a certain amount of these things here. Now, the black one, because it starts in the middle, if you get it out, you get an additional bonus two actions, meaning if you take one of the, the bonuses, instead of getting two actions, if we moved it out here, you can get four of them. Now, the pentagram action that we told you we'd come back to later, we just got two of them. So let's say we go here, we get this. This tells us we can do either one of these twice. So we can do two gem actions or two energy actions. And that would be it, like a one-time use. Or you can place it on your board in an unoccupied spot. And now when you place something here, like if I placed this here, I'm going to get one, two, three, and I could use this as this or this, depending on what, what I'm playing that turn. So in this case, I got one, two, three, four energy actions, if you will. Now, a new tile would come out for whoever else is going to enter or pass through this next. But if you end up entering or passing through one of these spots in the pentagram, you're going to get the points. And they start at seven and they go down one point each time. So the faster you get to these, the more points you get. Now, the last action we haven't talked about is the magic wand action. For each action, you're going to move down one spot, like one or two or three as you go down. And you're going to get different actions, like this is a gem. Uh, action, but if you're the first one there, you get to do it twice, for example, or maybe one point for every energy uh, network that you have finished inside the cauldron. So these just get you good actions and better actions if you're the first one down this track. Now you're getting 11 turns to place tiles on your board, and once that's over, the game will end, and then you're going to count up all your points, add them to the points you've already gotten, plus all the prophecies. you got points there, you've got many points of maybe owls behind your shield, maybe you had gotten some from the pentagrams, and whoever has the most points at the end is the winner. All right, which stone? Let's first talk about what I like about this game. Best thing by far is the building your own actions. You're getting a random assortment of tiles at the beginning of the game. Every time you play one, you're getting a new one that's sort of random, and you're trying to figure out what to do based upon all the possibilities going on, all the different actions and all the different ways to score. And you're trying to figure out some synergies there, and it feels very much like you're playing Kenichi's old game in Genius, uh, which is a great game where you, you know, put it's a, it was a Spieljahr's nominee, probably would have won if it wasn't up against, I think, was it up against Ticket to Ride that year? Um, and, and you're placing it and you're getting as many actions as things that you've linked together. And it just is a beautiful, beautiful puzzle in this game to, to, to basically harness everything that you do. And it is, the, it is the cornerstone of this game. And, it, and it's good because it is the best part of this game. It's just so engaging that puzzle you're just trying to figure things out and figure out the best way the most efficient way to get as many of these powerful actions as possible uh, i like that those gems start there in the cauldron and they sort of block what you're doing but you can use actions to move them out which get you bonus actions and i like that aspect of it the different scrolls the more powerful your action the more you have to choose from which one you want uh, and each of those are going to change your strategy. But if you don't end up using them, you still get points for them anyway. Some of them are, most of them are sort of end game goals, but some of them allow you to give you more powerful versions of actions later in the game. Lots of flexibility going on here. I love the route building in this, a la Ticket to Ride. You know, you're building things up and you're getting a certain amount of points depending on how long that was. But really you're setting that up for moving your witches around and setting them up for some of those prophecy cards as I showed but trying to do route building, bring your witches in, get points for standing them up and moving them around. But you can even use others' routes, but it costs an additional action. I like that. Everything in this game is well thought out, very flexible, but there's always trade-offs if you're gonna be doing something that's not as efficient as what you probably should be doing. Maybe you wanna be racing down the track of the wand track to try to get the bonuses and get the better bonuses if you get there first. You've got sort of the randomized setup of, again, which tiles you get for actions at the beginning of the game, but also where those different scoring chips are and which scrolls are coming out at the beginning of the game, which actions are on the pentagram. Lots of different things to think about in this game. There's a lot going on here. Uh, it's, it's, I'd say it's a good medium weight euro, but it packs a lot of game in about an under an hour. The box says 60 to 90 minutes. You should be able to play this in around an hour. It moves pretty fast. You just have 11 turns. But granted, on each turn, you're doing two different types of actions. Um, so really 22 different actions if you're not getting extra ones. Uh, it feels like you can get a ton done. It moves pretty quick if you know what you're doing. A uh, little bit of a learning curve there, but it's, it's, it's fantastic. This is a Reiner Knizia game that feels like a Stefan Feld game. If you play this and you said, who do you think the designer of this is? I would have said Stefan Feld off the bat. I would have said, oh, Stefan Feld used Ingenious. <laughs> I wouldn't have said Reiner Knizia used Ingenious in a game that felt like a Feld game. 
Uh, on the negative side of things, there was just one player aid in the box for the actions. Uh, there really should have been four. I mean, there's a lot going on, especially for a first time player. Once you've played the game once or twice, you don't even need the player aid. You might refer to it now and then, but it'd be really nice to have four player aids in there. Um, it would have been nice if the bags really fit all of the player components separately. The bags are a little too small. You really had to, they're really tight to try to get everything in there. Um, and the timing of some of the scoring isn't quite intuitive. Like sometimes I show you the owl and it's like, oh, I get that now. But when I get the owl and then it's a token, I get it and I flip it over and I don't get it now, but I get it the later of the game. And some of the things are just a little, a little rough edges there, but that's it. These are the little minor nitpicks because this game is fantastic. Because of these reasons, it is staying in my gaming library. Uh, and guess what? You know what? This means I have to get rid of something, but it also, I'm just going to let you know that the end of the year games, uh, you know, my final video of best games of the year is coming out. You might see this on at least one of those lists. So that was Witchstone. This has been the Game Boy Geek, breaking down barriers, growing relationships through board games by helping you on the next one you'll love. <laughs>